Well, good morning. So good to see you all here today. Another beautiful day. The cooler weather's coming in. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Have you had enough of that oppressive heat and humidity? Yeah. Well, you could always move to Florida. Where the bugs are large. And the alligators are in your backyard. Well, we've been going through the book of Luke, and today we're reaching chapter 7. There's a conflict between Jesus and a centurion and Jesus and a widow. So as we look at these two stories, we're going to see the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ and the faith of a man who really was not known for faith. In fact, the centurions were Romans. They were hated by the Jews, and they hated the Jews too. So it's a really interesting story about what Jesus does and how he handles this. The scripture for today is verse 16. It says, Then fear came upon them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God had visited his people. So we're going to talk about uh, two of the most popular subjects that anyone would ever want to talk about, which is sickness and death. Right? Death, the thing that people run from. And sometimes they literally do that. They get in their 40s and they say, you know, time is ticking down. And so they take up running and, you know, they run from death or they go to the gym and try to outwork death or, you know, they take pills and carrot juice and all this stuff and we try to fend off death. And yet every one of us has an expiration date. And we'll all stand before the Lord at some point sooner or later. And you never know exactly where you are in line, which is, always keeps us dependent on the Lord. So we've been looking in Luke. We saw Jesus and the Sabbath and how he handled it. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, so he's able to eat and heal because God does what he wants on the Sabbath. And Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We saw Jesus in chapter 6, 12 to 26, where he teaches on the Beatitudes. He talks about how blessed we are in situations where we don't think are so blessed. And he says, blessed are you who mourn, for you'll be comforted. Uh, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. So all of these things in which we look at is, wow, what a bummer. Jesus says, you're blessed if you're in this state, because God then comes alongside and restores in 27 to 42, we talked about loving and judging. Jesus says we're to love our enemies, we turn the other cheek, we go the second mile, and that we should not judge. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own? It tends to be the most judgmental people are the ones that have logs in their eyes. And it uh, gives them great comfort to find a speck in yours so they don't have to deal with what's in their own life. So Jesus talking about this principle of us seeing the smallest bit of what we have tremendous amounts in our heart for. And uh, we just got to get down off the, off the judge's bench and do the Lord's will by helping people to get the speck out of their eye. But we have to make sure our own lives are taken care of first. Then we were in 43 to 47. We talked about trees and rocks, and Jesus says a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit, and a good tree can't bear bad fruit. He's talking about human beings. And if you truly know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be good fruit hanging on your branches. And he says, if you do the things that I say, I'll tell you what you're like. You're like a man who built his house on a rock. Dug down, put a foundation, put it on the rock, and the wind came, the storm blew, and the waters riz, rose, and it stayed because it was built on the rock. The rock is actually doing what Jesus says. It's not just knowing what Jesus says or attending services or taking communion or any of those things which we might find value in adding to our salvation. It's one of those things that either you're a good tree or you're not. We talked about sickness and death today. We're going to talk about these two situations. So beginning in the first part, and let's see. I have it broken up in two parts in case I don't get through in time. We'll just cut it, we'll just cut it loose, and I have less work to do next week. So, <laughs> which I'm happy about. So I'm going to fly. Fasten your seatbelts. Verse 1. Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant 
who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. And so when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and to heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation. He has built us a synagogue. And then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should come enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and another servant, do this, and he does it. And Jesus heard these things. He marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well, who had been sick. Yeah, that's the happy ending right there. So Jesus heals this servant. Let's, uh, let's unpack this because I think it's full of information. He concluded all of his sayings. So he was done with what we call the Beatitudes and in the hearing of the people and he entered Capernaum. Now you remember Capernaum, it's the house of Peter. So it kind of becomes the hub for Jesus's ministry there in Galilee. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of Peter's house, which has been preserved. If you go over there, you'll be able to see it. And right near it, there's actually a synagogue, which is actually right by Peter's house, right on the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a pretty awesome thing to see from what I understand. I've never been there, but it's pretty neat. So this is Peter's house, but it's also a synagogue, which is right by it. So that, uh, that octagonal uh, roof that you see is preserving that old synagogue. And uh, the, the structure you see in the foreground, that's actually Peter's house. So this has been, uh, this tradition has been handed down for years. So they're, they're pretty sure this is where it all went down. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Well, if you know anything about centurions, they're people who are over 100 men in the Roman army. So they're, they're kind of like a lieutenant, if you will. So this guy's in the Roman army, part of the occupying force in a country that is not theirs. And he has a servant who's sick and dying. It's interesting that he would even care at all because he could just buy himself another servant. At this point, there were 6 million slaves. 6 million slaves. They were, it, was, it was like a four to one ratio to all of the citizens of Rome versus their slaves. And so but he has a servant that's dear to him. And it's an amazing thing that a man in his position, military trained, and they train you not to have any heart and compassion whatsoever. Trust me, I've had to learn a lot. And he's concerned about this servant of his who's sick and nearing death. If you've ever spent any time with somebody who's on the verge of death, it's a very helpless feeling. You're there and there's nothing that you can do. And I'm sure he was a man of wealth. Uh, if he's able to do the things that he's done, he, he has money, he has power, he has authority. And yet in the face of death, no authority whatsoever. And that's the way it is with us. And it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or a pauper, we're all going to face this at some point in time. But he's not facing his own death. He's facing the death of a servant that he highly prizes, which is an amazing thing that he would have compassion on a servant. And when he heard about Jesus... By the way, he heard about Jesus. Amen. He sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and to heal his servant. And when he came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. It's interesting. Could it be this synagogue right here that's right next to Peter's house? It's believed it was. So the man in the story is actually the man who funded and helped to build this synagogue right by Peter's house. It's rather interesting. And they're in Capernaum. 
So I think it's interesting. Synagogue is actually uh, where we get a derivation of that called the congregation or the church. So it's a gathering place. Uh, they, they would have this, and as long as you had 10 families, you had a synagogue. You could build one, claim one, and the Jews would let you do that. So here, the elders of the Jews, he gets the elders of the Jews to say, listen, you know, I, I took care of you guys. I did you a favor. I need you to, to go find the rabbi. So he's, he's asking, here's a Gentile asking the Jews to go track down this rabbi. What humiliation for a man of such power and such caliber to talk to the Jews, a hated people, a subjugated people, and actually ask them to go track down Jesus. And we know he says later he's not worthy to go see him personally. So he sends them. And they go, and what they first say is, he's worthy. This guy is worthy. I mean, he not only does he have a compassion for his servant, but he built us a synagogue. And he loves our nation. So we're getting to see all kinds of qualities about this centurion that just don't fit the mold, right? It's an amazing thing because centurions are mentioned four times in the Bible in the book of Luke and the book of Acts, both written by Luke. And they're always good guys. The one that was at the cross and said, surely this is the son of God. You have, you have the centurions throughout and they're always spoken well of. Remember, Luke is a Gentile. It's a rather interesting thing. Anyway, I find this all very interesting. So they come to Jesus and they beg on behalf of his worthiness that Jesus would come and heal him. Isn't that interesting? When you pray before God, and if you had a sickness, would you pray on behalf of your worthiness that God would heal you or, or heal someone for you? Hey, Lord, remember me? And the pastor, I'm praying for this one. I, I'm expecting a little return here because, you know, I do a lot of work for you. Is that really the right posture? Isn't it interesting? We read through the scripture and we just go right over all this stuff, but they're not the only people that he sends. And then Jesus went with them. So Jesus actually buys this and he says, I'll go. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends. What kind of friends do you think a centurion has? Other Romans, right? They went to him saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. It's funny, the, cent the centurion has a completely different perspective of his self-worth. The elders say he's worthy He's saying, I'm not worthy. Amen. The friends say, now it's not, these are the words of the centurion given to the friends and the friends are speaking as though they were the centurion himself. So when you go back to Matthew and you notice it says the centurion said, and it sounds like Jesus is having a conversation directly with him. He's not having a conversation directly with him. And so all of the artwork that you see where there's actually a centurion talking to Jesus, it wasn't happening. Just thought I'd let you know. These are things you find when you scour the internet. Lord, do not trouble yourself. I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. So they don't plead for Jesus to come to the house. They just say, listen, you're not, I, I'm not worthy to come to you. And, and I, I can't even have you under my roof because like I'm nobody. By the way, whatever the world tells you about your self-image, that's correct. Because before God, what do we have morally to offer? Nothing. Zero. And unless God does the work, there's no work done. And we will just be animals and we'll act like them. And so there was no s soldier actually before Jesus, as you might see in all of the, the pictures, but it says though he were there because it's a delegation who's there on his behalf, and they're his friends. I didn't even think myself worthy for you to come to me. And Jesus responds to their humility, or the centurion's humility. You see, the elders went there and pleaded the case on behalf of his worthiness. That gets Jesus to walk in that direction. But what turns the corner is humility. 
when we throw ourselves on the mercy of God, we'll never be disappointed. God honors humility. So, Matthew 15, verses 26 to 28, this is the same exact occurrence, and Matthew is going to give us a little bit more information. But he answered and said, it is not good. I'm sorry. That's the next slide. There was one other person in which Jesus marveled at, and it was a woman. I'm sorry. There was one other, one other group of people that Jesus marveled at, and it was in his own hometown in Nazareth because they didn't have faith. Jesus marvels at his faith, but he marvels when there's no faith. Two times Jesus marvels. All the rest of the marvels in the Bible have nothing to do with Marvel comics. All of the other marvels have to do with people marveling at Jesus. You know, when he, he stills the ocean with a word and, and they all marvel. And Jesus is marveled twice and it's either by faith or the absence of faith. And he's amazed, the, the word we get amazing from. It says in Matthew 15, 26 to 28, but he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Do you remember he said this to a Syrophoenician woman who was coming up and wanting him to remove a demon from her child? And he responds to her with this statement. It is not good to take the children's bread, meaning that which is destined for the Jews, and give it to the little dogs referring to the Gentiles. This is a test, by the way. And she said, yes, Lord. So she agrees with him. But the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table, meaning I'm asking you to remove a demon from my child. It's a small, little, teeny crumb for you. That was some faith. And then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. There was a test. Jesus was testing her. Are you coming on the basis of your worthiness? Because you know you're not worthy. You're not even Jewish. And she says, yeah, I know I'm a little dog. But the crumbs falling from the master's table, even the little dogs will lap those things up. She had great faith in him as the master. And so Jesus responds to humility. He doesn't respond to say, you know, I deserve this, Lord. You know, I deserve, you know, a Mercedes Benz, a house on a hill, you know, a thousand wives like Solomon. Forget all that. You don't know what you're asking for. But I say... But say the word, and my servant will be healed. You see, the centurion has a plan. I don't need to come to you. I don't need to see you. You, from wherever it is that you are, can say it, and it'll happen just like that. You just say the word, and you'll be healed. That's great faith, isn't it? Amen. Do you have such faith when you pray to God? It's interesting. When you pray for rain, do you carry an umbrella? Don't you think you should? Do you look for God to answer your prayers or you just throw them up there so you can say, yeah, yeah, I prayed for you? Or do you, do you check back and say, hey, how's it going? What's the, what's the Lord doing in your life? Because I prayed for you. What's up? You see, with this expectancy that God's going to answer, many of us just pray because we, we just unload ourselves and, oh, well, I feel better. I feel like I just unloaded all that stuff out of my heart. That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is about interacting with God to accomplish his will and then watching. That's what great faith does. He says, say the word and my servant will be healed. Those are words of faith. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. He says, just say the word. Just say the word. Where is he getting this? Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament. 9, then God said, verse 11, then God said, 
verse 14. Then God said, let the lights be in the firmament of the heavens and let them divide day from night. And 20, then God said, you see, God created everything by speaking it into existence from nothing. So whether you believe in a big bang or not, it all began with him. He spoke it into existence and it was. And so this centurion gets it. He understands that God can speak it and it happens. And he's saying this about Jesus. That's great faith. It says in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, he, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. By who? By Jesus, all things are created and are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Do you see the deity of Jesus Christ is very clearly labeled in the scriptures. So if anybody tells you that it's not there, you could tell them they're mistaken. He says, I say to one come and he comes, one go and goes. This guy has an understanding of what's going on. In Psalm 107, David writing about this, he says, their soul is abhorred in all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. It sounds a lot like what's happening with this servant. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, much like what the centurion did. And he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. This is exactly what Jesus does and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works on the children of men. Jesus can speak the word from anywhere. Sometimes we think we need a person to solve our problems. You know, if, oh, if only you were here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, God can do anything. Jesus can do anything from anywhere at any time. That's what real faith looks like. Authentic authority is under authority. Notice when he says, I'm like you, Jesus. I'm a man under authority. He said, Jesus is under authority. Isn't that interesting? Because Jesus is the authority, right? But he says, I'm like you. I'm under authority as well. Well, how did he know all this? Well, Jesus says in John 5, 30, I can of myself do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He says again in John chapter 6, verses 27, 37, 39, 44, do not labor for food that perishes, but for which food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Notice the dependence upon the Father. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Notice Jesus is subservient to the Father. And the one who comes to me by I will know my means cast out. In verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should rise up in the last day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And John 8, 28, then Jesus said to them, Will you lift up the son of man? Then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things. And Jesus says it over and over and over and over when he's in the garden. And he says, Father, if this cup could pass for me, but not my will, thy will be done. Jesus is showing himself to be one who is under authority. The centurion realizes if you're under authority, that means you have authority. The centurion, when he speaks, he speaks with the weight of Rome because he's under authority, not because he takes authority. Authority is not something that you take. It's not something that you uh, outstep somebody, outperform somebody. It's something that's given to you by somebody in authority. And if you're not working under authority, then you have no authority. And he understands this principle. Authentic authority is under authority. Here in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, with that in mind, think of what Jesus said. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me 
in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples. Do you see that Jesus is conferring authority? Because I have authority over everything. You now have authority because I'm sending you. Did you ever think that you had such authority? And yet that's to be handled with humility, isn't it? Because it's a delegated authority. It's not something that you have created or you're worthy of. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. By the way, a disciple isn't a convert. It takes a whole lot longer to make a disciple than a convert. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And what do you do? You baptize like we are in the 26th. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. That's involved in making disciples. To observe. Not just teaching them information. Teaching them to do what Jesus says. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded and commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus reassures them at the end. I'm giving you authority and don't worry about it. If things get a little shaky, I'm with you. You have my authority. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I feel kind of special and I'm a little trepidatious. It's like somebody putting something worth a, a million dollars in my hand that could break. Oh, 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 take this, take this, take this, take this. I, I don't want the responsibility of, for this thing in my hand that I could drop because I, I drop things. And lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. It's a comforting thing. And Jesus heard these things. He marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him. He didn't say it to the centurion. He said it to the crowd. Why? Because it's a teaching moment. I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. He's saying this centurion understands something that you guys don't get. Remember, Jesus with his disciples and a huge crowd of followers were moving into this this area and he's talking to them. And so he says, these guys really have it together. In Matthew 8, 11 and 12, he, uh, Matthew filling in uh, the, the, the same exact thing with a little more information. And I say to you that many will come from the East and the West and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is shaking up the people that think that they belong to God and they can do whatever it is that they want without a relationship, without a savior, because of who their forefathers are. And Jesus said, it doesn't work like that. And he says, there are going to be all kinds of people. He says it's about this centurion. There are going to be people sitting down at the table at the banquet before the Lord who aren't Jews like you and I because we placed faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the only reason why. And it's funny because the Gentiles actually were thought to be kindling for hell. In fact, that's what the rabbis taught and they, they still have it written that Gentiles were created for kindling for hell. Cause you got to have kindling. Yeah. One of the two things that a rabbi would always pray is thank God. Thank you, God, that I am not a woman and that I am not a Gentile dog. Those are the two prayers on the, so you can see how there'd be a real separation with these folks, but Jesus is going to bat for the centurion because he's got faith. So Jesus is upsetting everybody unilaterally, just, you know, he's letting the disciples eat on the Sabbath. He's healing on the Sabbath. He's like in the face of everybody. I love that about Jesus. In Mark 6, verses 5 and 6, says this. He could do no mighty work there. He's speaking of his own hometown in Nazareth, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> and he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about all the villages in a circuit teaching. Jesus couldn't do the tremendous things that he wanted to do in his own hometown because they didn't have faith. But Jesus was able to heal this guy because he did have faith. He healed his servant. In Matthew 9, 21 to 22, she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. If you remember, this is a woman who was not a Jew either. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. 
And the woman was made well from that hour. She was thinking to herself, you know, I can't get through the crowd, but if I snuck underneath on my hands and knees and I just grabbed the edge of his, his garment, I know I'll be healed. That's some serious faith. Have you ever thought about that? What's it going to take for you to actually have real faith to believe that God can do something that he already wants to do? He's just kind of looking for a partner. And so those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. It's interesting. The passage talks about the healing, but when was the servant healed? He was, when did, I mean, did Jesus say Alakazam, Abracadabra, did he, you know, like when did, when did the thing happen? It didn't. You don't see Jesus pronouncing the healing. You don't hear anything about it, but it happens. You know, we think that there has to be some kind of a special, you know, something, some ceremony, I got to be in the right position or I got to do this enough times or, you know, we get so many things tied to it other than our unworthiness and God's compassion for us, which I don't know about you, but I can have faith all day long for you. I can pray for you and I believe God's going to do stuff for you. When it comes to me, I'm not worthy, Lord, you know, and it's hard for me to have faith for God to do things to me that I would have absolutely no problem having faith with you. You guys have the same yeah, there's a, there's a real problem in us. We have this sense of unworthiness. Well, the question is, why did Jesus heal the servant? He healed the servant because the centurion had faith. Well, can you have faith for other people? Apparently you can. It's one of those, hmm... When did Jesus heal the servant? We're not told. It just says, and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant who had been sick. He wasn't sick anymore. Boom, done. Jesus turns to the crowd and says, hey, here's a teaching moment. This guy's got more faith than all y'all. And they go home and the guy's fine. Interesting. So how, how do you know when this occurred or how it occurred or... It was a result of faith. Right? You guys get that, right? It's a result of this man's faith. And it was a done deal because he believed. No special mumbo jumbo. No, you know, got to put you on a prayer chain. Got to have at least 50 people. It's only 49. I'm not going to answer that prayer. You know, God doesn't look at things like we do. You know, it's not a crowdfunding thing. He has compassion. He wants to do things for us. And, and yet we have to believe the word of God and believe that he does care. And that's a hard thing for us to understand because a lot of times we don't even, we don't even like ourselves and we got to walk around in this skin. Second Corinthians seven fourteen says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So when your land, country, is messed up, what do you do? You pray and seek God and you repent. You see, there's this turning from our evil ways, turning from our apathy, turning from our uh, obsession with comfort and self. When we repent of that and seek God's face, he will hear from heaven and he will hear our land, heal our land. That's what we're to do, boys and girls, instead of trying to carry the weight of the world on ourselves and worry. And I don't know about you, but news is designed to make you burdened. I, I can only take so much of it. I, I get stuff on my phone all the time. You know, these people are shot. These people are dying. There were 13 Marines that were killed in Afghanistan. There was this, there was that. I'm like, oh, what's the scripture say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, his own people turning from their wicked ways, not the, not the people who don't know him. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
You see, it's up to us, guys. And we can't expect them to repent. It's us. So the second half of this is Jesus walking into the city of Nain. Now, it happened a day after that that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. And then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Two acts of compassion, one towards a sick ser servant and one towards a dead son. And this is two days in the life of Jesus. I just think it's uh, an amazing thing. You think you have a hard day or a hard week. So it happened the day after that. He went into the city called Nain, by the way. It means beautiful. And many of his disciples went with him. And a large crowd. Notice the separation. His disciples, which were more than just 12. And a large crowd. So we're talking a bunch of people. Jesus walking into a small city with throngs of people behind him. And so what do they run into? A funeral. They're trying to walk into the city. These guys are walking out of the city. If you know anything about cities in this time, they've got small gates. You don't get giant crowds of people through them. You can only, you can only get one direction. It's a one way, you know, like a, like a covered bridge that'll only fit one car. Compassion is uncomfortable, inconvenient, and can involve challenging and challenging the unconcerned into conflict. If you're going to be a person who looks like Jesus and have compassion, the people that are with you are going to get dragged into things that they may not want to be involved in. You know, like driving to church with your family and there's somebody on the side of the road with a flat tire apparently can't help themselves. So you pull over and you're going to help. But everybody else in the car is going... You know, church starts in five minutes. <laughs> if you're going to be a person of compassion and see God's hand of opportunity in things like that, you're going to be inconvenienced and you're going to inconvenience everybody with you. Just be well aware. You, you want to have a, a bunch of really good people on your team and realize that people are more important than being on time for church. Because who knows, it might be the salvation of that person in that car when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And isn't that more important as to whether people are looking at you? Oh, look at that. But we get, I get tied up into those things. Like this morning, I had to be the first person here. I had to be, I had to be the first person. And I feel like if I'm not the last person to leave, something's wrong. I'm getting weak. But if you're going to be a person of compassion, if you're going to be a person who cares about people, compassion is an interesting thing. It's carrying the pains of other people in your heart. It's feeling their pain. Did you know that the scripture instructs us to do this? We're, we're to weep with those who weep. We are to take on those things, but not completely because we're not a Messiah. We're an emissary, which is different. And we bring these things to the Lord. So here they go. And when they came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. I don't know if you've ever 
had to go somewhere and you know you say I got just enough time and you pull out of the driveway and you pull onto the you go to pull onto the highway and there's a funeral procession somebody important because it's like a mile long <laughs> and so you got to wait even though you got the green light and they got the red light they keep going <laughs> and the light turns red for you and it's <laughs> And you're like, oh, is this ever going to end? I mean, you think perfect timing, right? Perfect timing. I couldn't have left two minutes earlier and missed this whole procession. Because see, Jesus, his disciples, and all these people can't go into the city now because they're all coming out and there's people wailing and crying and because you don't bury bodies in the city. You bury them outside. And so here's this giant procession of people feeling bad for this woman. And it's like, oh, great. Now we got to wait. Isn't, isn't that how we think? Yes. I don't know about you. I, I think, oh, we got a traffic problem here. We're going to have to wait for this to, to be done. Uh, I got to wait. Or <laughs> terrible luck I had today. Or what an uncomfortable social setting, being standing there and having people bring out their dead right in front of you. That, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> or you might think, better you than me, pal. You know, <laughs> sucks to be you. I'm glad I'm not dead. <laughs> these are the things, these are the things that people think, I'm telling you. <laughs> stay back, you stink. How long has he been dead? <laughs> By the way, the Jews bury the same day. They still do this. They bury the same day. So this is all fresh. This is all raw. They put you in a... I didn't need to tell you all this. So stay back, you stink. So, you know, you see a dead body and suddenly it's like, whoa, give him some room. Or you say, stay away from me. And then you start wondering, I don't want to die. Whatever he died of, I have no idea, but I, I don't want to die. And then you start wondering, you know, are they wearing masks? <laughs> this is what's going through your head. I, I know it. You know, well, how did he die? Did, did he shoot her? I mean, you, you know, I, I, you know, watch out for the widow, I guess. Uh, you know, what is the city? Is this city unsafe for me? Maybe I shouldn't be going in here if they're taking a dead guy out of the city. And then you start thinking, well, what is their policy on guns? <laughs> it's an amazing thing when we come up against a conflict, all of the things that will run through a fleshly mind. Jesus sees the situation and he wants to get involved. And he doesn't want to stay away. He goes up and grabs hold of the dead body. Why don't we have a heart like that? We're more concerned with traffic. We're more concerned with all of the details. We're more concerned with whether there's some harm to us or whether, you know, you know, if he died of a disease, everybody could be sick and, you know, since when do we think, Lord, what would you have me do here? What do you want me to do? So here's this situation. He's a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother. If you know anything about the society back then, you have to be a male to own property. That, she's a widow, which means she has no husband. Her husband's done. All her hope was in her son taking care of her. Her son's gone. Guess what she owns? Nothing. She is at the mercy of whatever relative it is that she got scraped off onto. Wow. So Jesus says, here's a widow who's already lost her husband, and now she's lost her son. And there was a large crowd with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion. Jesus saw a widow with a son who just lost her son and had compassion. You know, you and I find it hard to think that God gives a rip sometimes. I'm trying to be honest with you here. Parents outliving their children is a very difficult thing. And it doesn't matter if it's a child who's in their 40s, in their 20s, in their adolescent years, or even one that dies before being born. It is all so difficult to bear. Someone surviving their children. 
And Jesus has compassion. Shouldn't we? When the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself, it means that you put yourself in their shoes and feel what they feel. Imagine being a widow, having no one and lost the only son after your husband died and being at the mercy of whatever relative would take you. And of course, they're going to be like, all right, you can stay with me. We've got a shed in the back. I'll put a cot out there or something. Jesus has compassion. We think, well, if God had any love whatsoever, he wouldn't have let it happen, right? Well, sometimes he has better plans. Amen. Like he did with Lazarus. Compassion without action is a huge detriment. Some of you have the gift of compassion. You know what it is to feel someone else's pain and then carry it and not know what to do with it? How many of you have done this? It will kill you. Because we were never designed to do that, but you know who does? Jesus. We were never designed to carry that pain and sorrow. Jesus is. You can have compassion, but without action, it's incredibly cruel to other people. And it's incredibly cruel to yourself to carry it. Compassion. Feeling someone else's pain. Actually feeling it. And I did some studies on compassion, and it's rather interesting. There are ways that you can develop compassion. And they have lots of flow charts. It in involves wisdom and strength and commitment. And there are all of these things and how they interact. And if that looks like a confusing chart, I've got another one for you. <laughs> all of the ways that you can cultivate compassion. And if that's too confusing, here's one that's really confusing. There are various elements involved in developing compassion. But if you can't walk a mile in the other person's shoes, then you can't have compassion, essentially, okay? And it needs to motivate you to action. And what happens is as you get involved with people, instead of avoiding the dead body, whoa, whoa, we better roll out and let these guys go by and don't get too close. As we don't isolate and we involve ourselves, the scripture says it is better to be in a house of mourning than the house of mirth. The scripture tells us that we should draw near to that. And it, it's just, you know, we don't draw near to pain. We don't lean into difficulties. We don't find people who are complex and have lots of trouble. We don't naturally gravitate towards them. We withdraw, right? And isolate. Welcome to post-COVID-19 world. But then I talk too much. So it says here in James chapter 5, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. If anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will heal such a one. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. This is the rest of the scripture. I'm running out of room. You see, Compassion is demonstrated by action. Not just feeling, not just emotion, not just, oh, do something. Make sense? Yes. But have some compassion. Some of you don't have any. <laughs> or, or a limited, very shallow, I'm talking about me, shallow on that end of the pool. You know, one of the greatest things that's helped me to have compassion is my wife. because she has a deep heart and I have a very shallow heart on that end. I do other things better, but I won't tell you about those. <laughs> and then he came and he touched the open coffin. A Jewish man is not to touch a dead body. You're not supposed to have anything to do with the dead. It's contamination. You disqualify yourself from worship. You are now having to be excluded for seven days. You've got to wash and be separated from people. It's a whole quarantine situation. I could have pulled up the scriptures from Deuteronomy, but trust me, they're there. And those who carried him stood still. Yeah, they froze. Jesus has a hold of this dead body. What do we do? I don't know. Uh, I guess we just stand here. They stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. 
Young man, that means he was under 40 years old. The term used for young man is under 40. So he's under 40 years old. Young man, which is a term of affection. If someone used it for me. I say to you, I say to you, Jesus, the one who spoke everything into existence, say to you, he's not just speaking to a dead body, is he? He's speaking to a person. Arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak. Now, you're a pole bearer. <laughs> Jesus grabs hold and you go, whoa. Okay, what's he doing? He says, arise. And you're like, does he realize he's dead? Does he think we're just taking him for a ride? Or... And the dude sits up and starts talking. I would love to know what he said. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Let me down. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder if they dropped him instantly. And then he said, hey, can't, can't you see? And so he was dead, sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. He pre oh, by the way, here's your son. Can you imagine the moment? The widow who feels like she lost everything. God's been unfair. It took my husband now taking my son and I got nothing. Suddenly in the middle of the funeral procession, he sat up and is alive and jabbering. And she's probably shocked. And Jesus says, say, oh, by the way, here's your son. I think that's funny. Yeah, there's no strings. I don't have my hand behind his back. This is your son. He's back. I wish I was there. Jesus intentionally defied the law and he risked being unclean to touch the dead body. You know, it's the same thing he did with you. He came down from his perfect place and put on human flesh and touched your dead body and made you alive. I know he did for me. And I can't stop talking. The reckless love of Jesus he wasn't concerned about himself. He wasn't concerned about what other people would say. He reached out, got involved. There's a giant crowd behind him and they're all waiting to get their turn to go into the town. And Jesus reaches out and puts himself right in the mess and right between the crosshairs of all the religious judgy people. It's the reckless love of Jesus who leaves the 99 in the wilderness and goes to find the one sheep. And when he gets that sheep, he goes into town, not back to the flock, goes back to the town with the sheep on his neck. And he says, rejoice with me because I found the sheep that was lost. That's you. Here's a nice Mother's Day gift for an only child. Dear mom, I love how we don't have to say out loud that I'm your favorite child. <laughs> you can only pull that off if you're an only child, you know, because, or you have to hide it when company comes over and your brothers and sisters join you. But I thought that was uh, interesting. I actually thought about buying it online, but I didn't. There are three recorded resuscitations by Jesus. Resuscitations? Yes, resuscitations. This isn't really a resurrection, is it? Because they're going to die again. The only one resurrected was Jesus himself because he'll never die again. There were three. One was Lazarus. And you know what Lazarus did first thing when he was healed? He walked. In fact, it was probably like this because he was all wrapped up and Jesus told the disciples, hey, unwrap him. Hey guys, it is the privilege of the disciples of Jesus Christ to unwrap new people who've been made alive from the dead. All authority has been given to me. Go into all the world and make disciples. Amen. Jairus' daughter, and his first, as soon as he went in and he told her to, to arise, she arose, and the first thing he said is, get her something to eat. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And all the post-resurrection occurrences of Jesus always have food involved, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> and the third one was the widow's son who he says, and what he does as soon as he's brought to life, he speaks. So these are the three times that are written about Jesus 
If Jesus has given you new life, these three will be the evidence of your new life. What are you eating? The word of God. What are you speaking? God's words. You see, what's your walk like? Walking in the ways of God. These three things are demonstrations that you too are alive, evidences. Romans 4.17 says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God is the one that speaks into existence those things that aren't. And he says it in such a way that it's a done deal. And he gives us the honor to show faith that he's going to do it. And we become partners with him. It says in Isaiah chapter 61, this is Jesus's mission statement. The spirit of the Lord, of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the joy, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The Lord does all this for our benefit and his glory. What a blessing it is to know the Lord. Amen. Then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. This report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. It's interesting. They thought that he was like Elijah. If you remember, there was a little boy involved with Elijah and he rose him from the dead, right? If you know anything about Elisha, which is the next guy who takes over after Elisha, there was also a child that was given to a widow and he was risen. Isn't it interesting? You can find that in 1 Kings 17. It says, Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. Interesting. Same language we see in the New Testament. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. And then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. It's proof when you can speak life. And the other one with Elisha is in 2 Kings chapter four, and he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. And so she went in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. And then she picked up her son and she went out. It's interesting. Both of those prophets had an incident very much like Jesus did. And yet Jesus does it better, doesn't he? And so Jesus confronts this difficult situation and leans into it. And his reputation goes throughout everywhere. Consider the contrast of this event. One group is going toward a cemetery. One group is going toward a city. Much like you and I. One group is mourning a death. One is celebrating life. Jesus and his disciples and all of these people following Jesus, seeing all of the miracles that he's doing, they're celebrating life and they run right into this mourning group. One grieving widow and one man of sorrows. It says in the book of Isaiah that Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. There were two only sons in this story. One was alive, destined to die, Jesus himself. One was dead, destined to live, the widow's son. Both will rise from the sleep of death. It's an interesting picture that the scripture gives to us. And as you know, as you look through the scriptures, there are so many layers. And every time you read it, you see something new. Isn't that what's delightful about the word of God? It always has something to say to our hearts, something about the way that we should live. Zechariah 12.10, 
And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look to me whom they have pierced. You know this is Christ speaking. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. You see, the scripture sees the depth of this confrontation as well with the widow's son, that there are two sons in the story, one destined to die and one that would live, but they will both live again. I trust that this has been helpful for you guys. I'm hoping the Spirit of God spoke to your heart this morning. As the worship team comes up, I'd like you to just take a moment to kind of bottle up the things that the Lord may have spoken to you this morning as we read through the scriptures. Jesus having compassion on this servant, a centurion having compassion on his own servant and sending for a Jewish rabbi. Jesus having compassion on a widow, being willing to reach out and touch a dead body and bring new life. And we are his ambassadors. He calls us to do the same. Amen.